Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this event about health and safety in colleges in further education. My name is Janet Farrow. I am a president elect of UCU and I also work in a further education college uh, in trade union education. So we've got a really good line of, uh, lineup of speakers today. Uh, we're joined by our general secretary, Joe Grady, uh, Alex Lancaster, who is head of health and safety at UCU, Adam Lincoln, who is a regional official for London. And we have two uh, lay reps with us, Lauren Mora from Blackburn College, uh, who's also on our NEC, and Maxine Luby from Oldham College, who is also on our NEC. In fact, a bit of a Northwest takeover, which is a proud Mancunian I have absolutely no problem with. So um, what we would ask is if you've got any questions or any comments to make, this is being broadcast on all of our social media platforms. So please do use this opportunity to ask questions. And we want to talk about the impact of, of further education return to campus, uh, which is the case for a lot of us now. And um, we really want this to have a practical focus on health and safety and how UCU can, can support branches and support members. So do get your questions and your comments in. So before um, I introduce the first speaker, um, uh, just as way of introduction, I wanted to um, point out, I'm sure you've seen it on the news today, that um, there were over 3,000 new um, UK COVID cases yesterday. Um, and as we know, a lot of the colleges are returning to face-to-face -to -face teaching, um, even when some of it could be done online. Um, this, is, this is surely going to... Um, you know, the, the corona cases are surely going to get worse in the next few days with this situation. Um, what I'm hearing is, and it, you know, it's going to be great to hear from people and, and hear what's happening on the ground. What I'm hearing is um, that a lot of the risk assessments are in place, but there are cases of um, staff and students not following the risk assessments. So um, that's something that we're going to explore. Um, but certainly, you know, we need to be putting pressure on our employers to make sure that, that these uh, the detail of the risk assessments are, are communicated properly uh, with all staff and all students so that they know where they stand. Um, and, you know, from a branch point of view, it's just so important, um, firstly, to acknowledge that you're all doing an absolutely brilliant job um, and, you know, to, to keep keep that up I think a lot of branches are spending so much time in negotiations with the employer that they um you know aren't always communicating everything to members that, that needs to get across to members so I think just communication on all levels is, is absolutely key at the minute um, and you know we want to get to a situation where everyone understands uh, their individual and their collective rights uh, in this in this situation, which is obviously why we're here. So um, without further ado, I will uh, stop babbling and I will hand over to our General Secretary, uh, Joe Brady. Thanks, Janet. Um, I can't believe as the Yorkshire General Secretary, you went in hard of a, of a Manchester. <laughs> but um, so I just wanted to um, start by saying that this is a a really important event for everyone in FE. Um, I'm really, really glad um, that Alex is here, um, our health and safety official, to be able to talk you through the new guidance um, that's been developed. Um, and I think it's going to be, I hope it's going to be a really, really helpful session for everyone. Um, everyone in FE has done such a spectacular job over the summer, um, ensuring that, you know, campuses can reopen. Um, notwithstanding all of the work that's been conducted over the summer, um, you know, to get people back to, to carry on teaching, to carry on the provision of everything else. It's been a huge amount of work. Um, everyone's done a magnificent job. We're really aware um, that workload pressures are increasing. We're really aware of these health and safety concerns that are happening right now on your campuses. And what we're doing right now is letting you know how best to use the materials that we have developed um, so that you can keep yourselves safe. And that's what's really key um, about today. Uh, but what you need to know is that the union in your region or in your devolved nation um, is 100% behind trying to ensure and enable you to do that as safely as possible. So today I wrote to branches in FE with the updated guidance that we're going to be talking through um, here. Um, there'll be an email going out to all members in FE tomorrow, letting them know that Branch has got this guidance um, today, because what we really need branches to do is obviously 
health and safety is individual, but it's a collective issue. So the guidance that we've issued and the, the letters that are associated with that are ways for you to individually act, but to act collectively. And if you are one of those colleges um, that Janet's outlined that maybe put a good risk assessment in place, um, but circumstances have changed and the risk assessment hasn't, or actually the standards set in place in that risk assessment are just slipping and slipping and slipping, what we want to talk you through is how you proceed to the next steps to ensure that you and members in your branch are safe. Um, so fundamentally, that's what we're doing today. Um, your, your union staff and particularly uh, Alex and a few other people have been working pretty much day and night um, over the last week to pull this material together for you. Um, we know it's really important, you know, Janet mentioned earlier just how rapidly um, the instances of infection, particularly in the age groups that we tend to teach in FE are increasing. Um, we're having reports already, and to be fair, we're getting reports of good practice um, of colleges acting quickly to close down cohorts and, and to um, take the action that's needed. But we know that's not going to happen everywhere. And therefore, we've got to really prepare for the worst case scenario in certain places and ensure that you know exactly what you need to do so that if you end up having to do those things, we are there to 100% support you. So I'm not gonna waste any more time kind of talking through the details because there's other people who'll be able to do that. So I'm gonna hand back to Janet, um, but you know, just sort of know that we're with you and know that the materials that we provided, some of them are behind a um, password protected bit of the website. So if you don't know what your membership number is and you don't know what your password is, sort that out now because some of the materials that we are putting up there are things that you need to access um, privately through that. So thank you, and I will uh, see you in a bit. Thanks, Joe. And uh, I know what side my bread's buttered. I know GS is a, is a proud Yorkshire person, so um, obviously everyone welcome here. Um, so without further ado, I'd better better stop and, um, and hand over to Alex Lancaster, who is UCU's national head of health and safety. Thanks, Janice. Yeah, so um, as Joe mentioned, we put out some more guidance today um, for branches and particularly looking at the collective action that branches can take when they're trying to protect their members from serious and imminent danger um, or, you know, various different health and safety at risks due to the current crisis that we're in. So the guidance takes you through a process of negotiation ongoing review and the sort of actions that you can take as a branch. So when we're looking at a negotiation, we put out previous guidance, um, which is available on the website for FE and HG. And if you look at it, we, we've got the five W's, you see use five tests, um, and we look at bargaining um, aims for branches, which you know hopefully you've already got in place. Uh, which will help at this stage in the crisis, such as a risk assessment, risk management framework, safe systems of work, a procedure for serious and imminent danger, and various other um, procedures that will support where we are at this stage. So um, what we're calling for at the moment is an urgent review of your COVID-19 risk assessments. And the reason for that is because there's been some significant changes taking place. And, you know, the regulations do require there to be ongoing monitoring of risk assessments to make sure they continue to be suitable and sufficient, to make sure they're capturing all the current risks and they're putting proper uh, preventative and protective measures in place. And so some of the, um, you'll be aware of some of the significant changes that are happening at the moment. So as Janet mentioned, we've got a significant increase in infection rates currently. We've got a lack or a limited access to testing for people with results coming back slowly. And we've got a poorly functioning track and trace system. And as we know, compliance to isolation is also quite poor. And so all of these are risks which an employer does have to take into account when they're conducting their risk assessments because it's going to have a significant impact upon how well they're able to manage transmission within their workplaces and the local communities. And so on top of that, we've also had recent reports from the likes of Stage and Independent Stage, 
and there's emerging data coming out all the time. I suppose the most significant we should mention today is the risk of aerosol transmission. And so the guidance that was sent out today, today does talk about, um, you know, the need for improved ventilation control measures and also the usage of face masks in indoor spaces, which of course is a UCU national position. Um, and then we've also got um, our additional comments on online learning, which we feel that institutions should be moving more and more towards to prevent spread or transmission of the virus. So on top of that, let me just check what I've got. So the government has also issued additional guidance. So we've got guidance from the DfE and it talks about employers producing outbreak management plans. And, and it also refers to different tiers. So um, it's not very accessible, but it is linked in the guidance. Uh, but the government have kind of hidden some of the way that this, this might work. So it's very difficult to find if you just go on the website. But basically they'll work through four tiers. Um, and the idea is that your employers will create contingency plans, outbreak management plans that comply to each of the tiers. So at tier one, it's it's almost like business as usual with the COVID control measures in place, um, just standard control measures, but largely quite significant levels of face-to-face -face delivery. And then moving up through the tiers with additional restrictions, um, introducing more and more blended learning, less and less people on site until we get to tier four, where it is basically only essential workers on site. And so with that in mind, we want branches to look at how they will negotiate with employers to ensure that they're working at the appropriate tier so that any contingency plans are suitable to what is actually taking place in um, the community that they're based within. And so you'll see there's a bit of a con contradiction in that the outbreak management plan could ensure that employers are moving too slowly or being more reactive than preventative in their approaches. So while outbreak, man outbreak management plans are definitely needed, there is a concern that it would lead to more reactive um, responses from employers as opposed to preventative. And of course, a preventative approach is required under the health and safety legislation to avoid um, risks to harm and health and safety of people who are um, working there or studying there or visiting um, a workplace. And so for that reason, we do need to push hard on the health and safety legislation because the government guidance isn't necessarily going to meet the needs of the health and safety legislation. And so we need to be sure that employers are clear on that front. So the guidance does go into a little bit more detail on those points and then we lead up into what we would call a series of different actions that branches can take so there are various there are various actions branches can take depending on the scenario so obviously we would hope you've got a serious and imminent danger procedure in place that we can refer our members to we've also put out individual letters um, for branches to um, support individual members at particular risk due to any personal characteristics or if they're at a risk of um, danger due to the nature of their role or the lack of control measures within their particular area of work. And so branches will be able to facilitate that and, and help um, members individually on those fronts. In terms of the collective response, we would expect branches, if the risk assessment isn't suitable and sufficient, to have rejected the risk assessment and to have clearly outlined all the failings in the risk assessment and what preventative and protective measures they feel should be in place instead. And that could be about increasing the amount of um, online or remote delivery within a workplace due to the difficulty in containing transmission or preventing transmission. We can also... Um, refer members to the serious and imminent danger procedure if they feel at risk of serious and imminent danger procedure. And this is a collective agreement in the workplace. So it's a lot stronger than using section 44 of the Employment Rights Act. We've also got a series of escalation points and different steps that branches can take depending on the, the different circumstances. So, you know, we may have branches that have rejected the risk assessment. We may have 
branches where there's been a formal instruction for members to return to the workplace because employers don't agree with what our health and safety reps or branch officers are saying regarding um, control measures. And we may get into a really difficult situation where we have to escalate quickly into a failure to agree and um, in, in, introduce a trade dispute. So there's a number of stages that we need to take before we get there, of course. So union reps have certain rights. So they are entitled to um, perform their functions, the statutory functions, which involves investigations and inspections. So any reports or findings you've got should be used and sent to the employer to prove any um, risks that you feel are present in the workplace. You should formally reject the suitable and sufficient, a risk assessment that's not suitable and sufficient. You can report to the regulatory bodies, the health and safety executive, and also to the local authority. You can campaign and organize and publicize these failings, and you can issue template letters, both um, to individuals and collective letters as well. You can call for emergency safety committees or joint negotiating committees in term, well, as you're escalating these issues. And, you know, we can initiate a ballot for industrial action where we find that there are employers that are just heavily resistant and they are putting members' lives at risk. And so, you know, completing the whole picture, we will be providing additional support and resources. And it is really, really important that branches link in with their regional offices to get advice and guidance on all these things before taking any um, action and and just in, in general with help with advice and legal support etc so that's a good overview i think of the guidance as it stands and i'm happy to take questions when we get to the q a thanks so much alex that was really super clear um, and there's, there's a lot to get through um so we we will definitely come back to that when when we reach the, the question and answer section at the end. So um, our next speaker is Lauren Mora, who is a branch officer at Blackburn College and also sits on the National Further Education and National e Executive Committees. We should know the names of those, shouldn't I? So I'll hand over to Lauren. Thank you very much, Janet. Okay, so my branch at Blackburn College, we are currently the second um, with the area with the second highest rates of infection in the country. Um, we opened to students on Monday, so we were having full face-to-face -face delivery. There was no distance learning at all. Um, we had our first case confirmed Monday afternoon, which was a member of staff. By Wednesday afternoon, we'd had three cases confirmed. Um, we are now in partial lockdown in that we're in bubbles, and it's only the affected bubbles that are being closed down. We have, in my in the area that I'm working in, in A-levels, we have our second years who are in one bubble that's been closed down and the first years are still coming into college. The problem we have is that this member, the student that was um, infected has actually meant that five members of staff had to be quarantined. We had five rooms that had to be deep cleaned and we have now 110 students who are now on distance learning. However, the problem that that causes is, and while it was done very quickly and it was done um, very effectively in my particular centre, I know in other areas it was a little bit slower, but I think that was more down to they were waiting for Public Health England and the track and trace rather than it being the institution itself. A levels was very quick. We got our first confirmed case at half past two, and then we were in full lockdown by four o'clock with students off campus at that point. We've still got the first years coming into campus and still having lessons, but what we've discovered. Um, and they should really have discovered this earlier, is that there's a difficulty where you have a class of students, but their teacher is working from home remotely in a classroom that doesn't have a microphone and doesn't have a webcam. So the student is talking to a room full of students, but there's no interaction between them. Obviously that hasn't worked at all. We've not been able to do that. We then are in a situation where students have got half, some of their teachers in and some of their teachers not in. We have a situation where some students are working from home and some students aren't. It's very chaotic, it's very disorganized, and it's it's making us look particularly bad, I feel. Um, we found out today that our management are planning to run face-to-face -face open evenings in the next couple of weeks. So we're actually expecting a number of a number of members of the public to be coming in and walking around the building, which we will be very, um, we will reject strongly. We really do not want to do that. 
Uh, I'm not sure how that would be possibly seen to be a good idea in the current climate. Um, we're having the problem where we're having students who are coming to us and saying that they have um, symptoms, but actually we can't get confirmed cases. And we can't do anything until public health have confirmed that we do have a confirmed case. So while college is trying to get ahead with the deep cleaning, so if we have a student that comes to us and says that they have a that they have symptoms and then we're trying to get ahead and deep clean those rooms so we can still use them but we can't actually do anything in terms of sending staff or shutting down bubbles until we've actually had public health england come to us and say that they have this confirmed case um the problem we're having with that as well is that we're not really sure what this deep cleaning entails there's some some misunderstanding going on between the cleaners and between the management and towards the health and safety committee about what that deep cleaning actually means in the college well, staff i think are feeling quite vulnerable staff are not sure what it, it's not made easy by the fact that you walk outside our building we have a covid testing center on the car park that really brings it home to you so you can pretend that it's all happening somewhere else and it's not really going on we have students that have masks on in the corridors but not in the classroom but then you walk outside and there's this massive, huge tent in the middle of the property. Um, and it does make you think, yes, this is really happening to us. Um, we're waiting every day to hear if we're going into full lockdown. It's very uncertain and we're really not sure what to expect from day to day at the moment. That's the situation in Blackburn at the moment. Thank you, Lauren, um, for sharing your experience there. It's a, a pretty bleak, bleak picture, um, it sounds like. So really appreciate you, you coming out and telling us about that. Um, OK, so our, our next speaker is Adam Lincoln, who is regional official for uh, London Region uh, Further Education. So I'll hand over to Adam. Thank you, Janet. Thanks, colleagues, for having me on today. I thought I would just give a little bit of a perspective from the uh, point of view of being a regional official in London for education about what has been happening on the ground and where we think things are going in our negotiations with employers. I think there's been four main phases to this. There was the initial lockdown back in March where um, staff and students were sent home in FE as part of the general lockdown and we shifted to online learning. There was the attempt over May and June uh, to have a partial reopening of FE colleges um, for particular cohorts of students. Um, there's obviously been the government decision to have a full reopening of colleges for the autumn term. And I think we're now going into phase four, rising infection rates, local outbreaks and lockdowns, local lockdowns. So essentially, regional officials and regional officers and branches have been working very hard over the last six months to negotiate and secure agreements uh, with the employers during these different stages. Back in May and June, our main uh, negotiating position in London, and I understand have been taken in some other regions, was to reduce numbers of students as low as we could at the time on the basis of an educational need or justification. That was generally vocational cohorts of students and some uh, uh, year one level three students. Uh, and, and at the time we were conducting um, uh, risk, uh, sorry, we were conducting inspections of the workplace and looking at risk assessments to make sure that uh, measures were adequate on site to have a partial reopening. And we were uh, trying to negotiate agreements with employers around uh, arrangements to be put in place for vulnerable staff and essentially measures to have staff coming back on a willing and able basis at that time. We also established in many cases working groups with the employers, ongoing weekly working groups for COVID, uh, involvement of health and safety reps um, in the process, procedures for serious and imminent danger, uh, and that type of thing. Our general principle was uh, UCU's five tests as a framework and a principle of no return to work until it's safe to do so. Um, what happened over the summer uh, after that was essentially most of the employers went um, away and came up with plans for September. And uh, what we've been doing uh, since uh, staff have come back to colleges in September is uh, working very hard again with our local branch officers and reps uh, to scrutinise and negotiate the employers' plans uh, that we're currently working through now. Uh, and our aim has been to try and reduce numbers on site in the context of a full reopening of colleges and DfE government position around majority of 16 to 19 on site 
Um, uh, so trying to work around that situation and reduce numbers on site at any one time and class sizes uh, through a combination of arguing for blended delivery models and moving to, uh, towards online learning, splitting up groups and, and lowering uh, class sizes, uh, looking at occupancy limits in classrooms, social distancing measures, wearing of uh, face masks and using other types of uh, control measures. However, I've got to be honest with everybody that uh, many colleges were very late to finalise their plans and very slow to consult the union in many cases. Um, a fair number of colleges were also scrambling to put plans into effect. Some of them, uh, as recently as two weeks ago, did not have adequate uh, operational plans in place, let alone any type of consultation arrangements with the union. And so in some colleges, we saw, uh, unfortunately, a chaotic and shambolic uh, reopening and return to the workplace for staff, followed by students during the enrolment period. As it stands now, we think that what we've got is a small number of outlier colleges across England uh, who have chosen to implement a full return to face-to-face uh, uh, -to -face teaching and full class sizes. Um, and we think a majority of, of further education colleges have reduced numbers below 100% face-to-face. Many of them have uh, reasonably uh, adequate um, blended models in place, and there's a, obviously a variation around that. Many branches are carrying out inspections as we speak to check on numbers, um, social distancing, class sizes, health and safety measures. However, local lockdowns, local outbreaks and rising infections mean that the focus now shifts to what happens next. Uh, so from our standpoint in the regions on the ground, we are now, now that we've got through the last few weeks, really looking at what happens next. And obviously different parts of England, as uh, Lauren was talking about, have uh, very different experiences to other parts. But I think we can all agree that um, the direction of travel for everybody is in the wrong direction around rising infection rates, outbreaks, and, and so forth. So I think my current view is that it's been a difficult time for the union and its members. Uh, we've adapted and risen to the challenge. Um, I I'd like to reassure all members that all your regional officials and branch officers are in ongoing discussions and negotiations with your employers. Um, the updated UCU guidance um, as uh, uh, published today and sent out by the General Secretary wraps around this work that we have been doing uh, and provides a platform now for branches and regional officials to take stock of where we are, review current measures uh, and negotiate appropriate arrangements for the next phase of the pandemic, uh, given the circumstances we've been referring to. Um, and essentially, I think our position at the moment on, um, is as much as possible, we need to have blended models and we need to be moving towards online delivery as much as we can. Uh, we also need to be clear that uh, notwithstanding DfE guidance, which fudges essentially health and safety legislation and kind of uh, has lots of holes and ambiguities around it, the employers are responsible they have the legal duties to have a pre preventative approach to health and safety into the pandemic. They are therefore obliged to expect, based on the available information, that things will get worse. They already are. To have contingency plans in place, as Alex was talking about, outbreak management plans. And without any uh, effective test track, testing, tracking and tracing in place, employers should now adopt a precautionary approach. Um, there's too much at stake not to do that. Um, and the employers uh, need to factor in to their calculations and their risk assessments and their plans the uh, available information in relation to local outbreaks, local infection rates, and, and so forth around the pandemic. Our position is that employers have the legal duty, government guidance fudges. Um, the bottom line with employers is we expect a higher standard from the employers than the government expects. And we expect employers to reach agreements with us as we go forward to ensure we protect staff, students and the wider community. So coming back to the guidance now and wrapping all this together about how we take this forward on behalf of members uh, within colleges. No one size fits all in further education, as we know. And the situation is different in different colleges and it's different across different regions. Um, our focus now is on health and safety and a precautionary approach rather than just the DFE fudged approach. Employers are legally responsible and if they breach their legal duties, it's very unlikely that this government will step in behind them 
and support them, notwithstanding this government's uh, willingness to bend the rule of law, as we've seen in other issues when it suits their purposes. But I'm absolutely confident that this government will blame the college management if something goes wrong and uh, we have serious uh, uh, illness and, and even worse uh, as a result of their operations. The government will not support colleges. They're passing a buck. Uh, and so we, we need to make sure that employers now work with us to uh, set a higher standard in terms of what happens next. So we start with our five tests and our bargaining position uh, using a precautionary approach. We seek to work with the employers to make the workplace safe and continue to make it safe given the changing circumstances. And we... In particular, and Alex alluded to this, we, ne we, we need to absolutely make sure that we have in place as an urgent priority uh, serious and imminent danger procedures. This is because the employer has a legal duty, and it had this before the pandemic, to have serious and imminent danger procedures in place. The need is for that to be in place and, and for situations arising from outbreaks in the college and the pandemic to be factored into that situation. So that should mean that where we have situations where vulnerable staff are being put at risk, other staff are being put at risk, um, there are confirmed outbreaks or the situation changes, staff are able to follow a collectively agreed procedure and remove themselves from, from danger. So that has to be the priority. That is the quickest and most uh, effective way that we can uh, ensure people's health and safety in the workplace. However, and also, by the way, that would, that would apply where we have a situation where there's been a breakdown of the employer's health and safety management system, or we come to a view collectively that their risk assessments are not suitable and sufficient and the workplace is not safe. So that serious and imminent danger procedure is absolutely critical. Employers must reach agreements with us, with the union locally. Members will decide whether or not the employer proposals and measures are adequate and whether or not agreements been reached. So it's member-led and we uh, approach this collectively. If, if the members collectively feel the situation is uh, unsafe, then we escalate. The bargaining guidance that's been released today sets out in great detail all the available uh, ways that individual members and branches collectively can uh, uh, ensure that the employers are uh, encouraged and persuaded to reach agreement with us um, to make the workplace safe. We have a range of uh, tools in our toolbox and we can use all of those um, uh, with the support from membership. Um, obviously on the ground, uh, escalation, uh, depends upon the situation with the employer and the level of organisation of the branch. Um, the key advice for me, of course, is take advice from your branch officers and your regional office and your regional officials before you contemplate any form of escalation in, in a situation where you find you have not reached agreement with your employer around safety. Uh, keep in mind the legal framework is not always helpful for us. So we need to maximise our leverage collectively and ensure we protect individuals. And we need to do that carefully uh, in a way that benefits us and maximises our position. Um, the final point for me is the regional officers and regional officials will, will continue to provide support to members and branches, in particular those of you that are dealing with rogue employers. I've got one rogue employer in London FE region, and we are making uh, arrangements to uh, to respond to that employer. Uh, and obviously where we do have situations locally where we have got uh, rogue employers or we have a need to escalate, we have, uh, we have an opportunity to link up to national campaigns and national support and resources. Okay, that's me done, Chair. Thank you, Janet. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, you know, such an important message there about you know the fact that the the guidance from the Department for Education is um, is something to be improved on. You know by employers and they have that opportunity uh, to show that leadership. Um, I'd like to just pause there really and um, say a massive thank you to all of the UCU staff, um, both at head office and in our re um, regional and devolved nations offices, who have just been working around the clock um, during this time, scrutinising risk assessments uh, and providing really important uh, advice that's going to keep people safe and alive. So thank you very much from everyone on the, on the lay side. 
Okay, so um, our final speaker I'm delighted to introduce is Maxine Luby, who uh, is a branch officer at Oldham College and uh, yet another member of the Further Education Committee and the National Executive Committee. So uh, I know she's done a lot of work with the Black Member Standing Committee on risk assessments for, for Black members who are particularly at, at risk at this time. So I'll, I'll shut up and hand over to Maxine. Cheers. Solitude, should I say, at Oldham College, Greater Manchester. Um, what I wanted to talk about is two things really. The, the issues around generic risk assessments and, and also personal um, risk assessments. Um, and, and I think it's really important we do that because they are two very distinct areas that need looking at um, collectively as a whole, as what happens throughout the colleges and also those individuals who may find themselves in need of um, additional support or, or risk assessment. The first thing I'm going to start with is um, a plan for a second possible wave, which looks quite imminent, according to the experts, not according to what I say, but what the experts are saying. And I think that's really important because I think FE at the moment is caught up in getting people back on site, getting people logged onto systems so that they can learn remotely. But I've not actually heard anything specific, I'm speaking for myself here, um, about what are they doing to plan for a second possible wave and I think this is really important because the focus is not there yet and that seems like it's going to be quite imminent. Um, over in Oldham we had one of the highest Covid rates over the last couple of weeks, it's coming down a little bit now but most of our learners are returning to on-site, part on-site uh, learning and also remote learning and I think we need to plan for that. So uh, personally what I, 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 I'm going to do with our branch is make sure that that's included in that conversation about those dynamic risk assessments that are constantly being updated. And I think we need to be aware that they are a dynamic assessment. So that means they are a live document and not get caught up in the fact that, that your employer has done this fantastic generic risk assessment, you know, all singing or dancing, but they're not updating it according to uh, local restrictions and, 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 and um, local restrictions and the changes that are happening. So one of the most important things we need to look at, I think, is ensuring that we make sure we have that conversation about a possible second wave. And this is really important in FE, for example, because we, those of us who work in FE, we know that we don't have supply teachers, we don't have people who come in and cover. We're expected to cover, and that's standard. You know, there's times I've taken three classes in one because someone's off sick. And this is not just about COVID, this is about the fact that we're going into winter and we know that with winter comes coughs, colds and everything else that goes, from, goes with that. And it, all it takes is for one member of staff, one tutor to go off for the whole thing to fall apart. Now, if you're in a bubble and you teach in a bubble, what's the plan for that? Which is, is, which is a really important question. What does your employer plan to do if a member of staff is off and can no longer teach that bubble? Um, and that's a question we need to ask because I don't think it's feasible to accept that somebody else will pick up another bubble and teach a bubble because then that just makes a mockery of the whole system of ensuring that um, you are teaching a certain group and you remain with that group. So I think we really need to think about as branch officers and reps how we have that conversation with the employer about a second wave. I don't think we can stick our head in the sand anymore and think it's not going to happen and even if it doesn't happen which we hope it doesn't, we have a responsibility to make sure that we put that on the table and that's included in any generic risk assessments. In addition to that, um, it's really important that they are aware and make a note of general and local restrictions, local restrictions, should I say, whereas there are local lockdowns and restrictions in place. That needs to be included because that impacts on, on, on how the college functions from that point forward. So, Again, um, that's a conversation that needs to be had and needs to be included in those generic uh, risk assessments. In addition to that, there's a conversation about who is responsible for um, doing the administration around when learners start displaying, or even staff, but particularly learners, start displaying symptoms of COVID. Now, um, I think what the most important thing is that we should be asking for a designated officer who is responsible for COVID 
related issues. So if um, a teacher reports that a, a, a student is displaying signs, that a COVID related officer will pick that up and follow that process through. I don't think it's acceptable to be asking teachers to do that because that is not really their job. It's a serious commitment to ensuring that that information is correct and it's accurate and it's reported to the various bodies, including possibly the local authority and um, public health. So that's something that we really need to consider. And it's a question we need to ask as members and as branch um, officials and reps, who is responsible for the recording of any student who is displaying COVID symptoms? So that's the generic picture, which I think is really important. Uh, another thing that I want to mention, which is also very important, is accessibility in terms of how are our students getting that information. Now, I work in an area that it has a high proportion of Black Asian and minority ethnic um, communities. Now, we find it difficult ourselves to understand what the government guidelines are. So I'm, I'm not sure how difficult it must be for those, particularly those who have a, a English as a second language. How are we communicating that information? Is it accessible? Does it make sense to them? Does it talk to them about what's happening in their local area and community? Again, that's something that needs to be included in any risk assessment. That information is accessible to all members of, um, of the community and the students who use that particular college. So that's a generic picture and some of the things that I think we really need to consider going forward generically with our, um, with our employers. Um, but just as importantly, it's those individuals who are, who are going into colleges and doing their best to provide teaching and learning. And a couple of things that have become very apparent. Um, one is, is that the lack of understanding on, on some managers and senior managers part of what's required in an individual risk assessment. What, what questions should they be asking? Why are they asking those questions? How does that impact that individual? And, and I think sometimes some managers may not be aware that it is an individual risk assessment that is based on the particular needs and circumstances of that individual, which means not only about whether, they not, whether or not they can come into college and teach, but what are their personal circumstances at home? What would happen to them if they contracted COVID? Do they live on their own? Have they got any support networks in place? Um, do they have any disabilities or conditions that may impact negatively? These are the kind of questions that are really important and we should be making sure that they're included in the conversation around uh, personal uh, risk assessments for individuals. In addition to that, another really um, important factor is age and, and the, the, uh, the advice that we're being given and, and the, the, the knowledge is saying that age is the biggest factor. Now, again, this can be a difficult conversation to have because a lot of people may feel um, not comfortable about talking about their age and, and the impact it may have on them. But a, an employer, a good employer, should be able to look at that and make sure that any individual risk assessment considers age and the impact COVID could have on that individual should they become sick. Just as importantly, and probably up there in the top three, and I think sometimes we overlook this, is mental ill health and anxiety. Now, some people may not be vulnerable. They may not have underlying health conditions. They may not have a, a disability, a physical disability. However, anxiety and stress, as we know, can play a major, major part in how we respond to life's events. And I don't think we're paying enough attention to the anxiety that many people may be experiencing of returning to, in, returning to um, a job where initially and fundamentally, should I say, you're kind of on the front line. And I think that is really important when we're talking about assessing risks for individuals. What, what, what is their feeling about returning to work? Do they feel anxious? Are they comfortable teaching the numbers that they have in their class? Do they feel that they're not pro properly um, equipped at that point to, to, to support that kind of learning? Um, what is the employer doing about ensuring that questions are asked about how people are feeling about the anxieties around surrounding COVID because there are a lot of anxieties and I think sometimes we forget that that's just as important as get, jumping into a car or jumping into a bus and going into work in FE. 
there are a lot of anxieties that need to be considered and they need to also form part of that risk assessment. So we've looked at the generic and we've looked at the personal. Any good risk assessment should take all those things into consideration. They should also be looking at what's going on in the community. Are they in touch with community groups? How are those messages being relayed to community, uh, community members? You know, how are they supporting the community? FEs don't function alone. They don't function as standalone colleges. They don't function as standalone institutions. And if they do, they shouldn't be. They should be making contact with community groups and community leaders to ensure that our staff and our students who are entering our FE establishments have a clear understanding of the expectations, have a clear understanding of what support is available to them and have a clear understanding of the college's role in making sure that as much as possible, anybody who enters the building is safe and they feel confident that sufficient measures are in place to protect them. Thank you. Wow, Maggie, that was absolutely incredible. Some hugely important points there. Um, I'm just blown away, to be honest. Um, you know, in particular, I think you're picking up on the uh, the anxieties issue is so important, you know, because apart from anything, these anxieties are not unfounded, not that any anxiety is, but, you know, the, these are real issues and we don't want our employers to be kind of explaining it away with, you know, so-called resilience training or whatever else uh, might be coming out of the woodwork. Okay, so... Um, Ed's going to bring all of the panel back in now, I think. Uh, we've had some absolutely excellent questions through on social media. Tricky questions, some of them. Um, and I think a lot of them are going to fall to Alex Lancaster, who is our, our health and safety lead. Uh, but if any of the other panel wants to, wants to come in, uh, just indicate in, in the chat that we've got and, um, and, and I'll bring you in. So, see if this works, Ed. Um, I'm presuming we're going in the order that, that um, I saw. So, if you could put the questions on the screen. And the first question was about disability leave and about um, how we can, oh, there you go. How can you see you at a local and national level help the fully paid disability leave without penalty for those who have long term health conditions that create risk re COVID 19 for members who need this? So, I'll start with you, Alec, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I think any kind of risk of people not not complying with risk assessments or isolating if they've got symptoms or, or ill health has to form part of a COVID-19 risk assessment. So they also have to factor in the different equality impacts on, on the groups within the institution. So that, you know, this is all in our guidance that we would expect to be negotiated by branches. So in terms of getting full pay, you know, if you're not getting full pay, you're more likely to go into the work when the workplace while you're while you're ill, and that is obviously a, a risk that an employer's got to manage. Um, I don't I don't know if anyone else wants to add any more to that. If, if I can bring in another element, um, I'm just testing Ed's agility skills here, really, because it might not need to go up on the screen. But there was a question around what happens if um, somebody from a staff member's household shows symptoms. So I think that's probably linked to what, what you were just saying. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> what you were just saying, Alex. I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that, but it sounds linked to what you were just saying. Yeah, it is linked. I think, you know, when we, we put up guidance um, around what sort of um, hazards we believe will be present in in workplaces they don't capture everything and the sort of controls that we would expect employers to put in place to keep people safe and we you know we do list vulnerable groups as part of that and also anyone who has um, members of their households who are at increased risk uh, including like things like travel to and from the workplace and stuff like that so anything that could increase transmission in the workplace or you know have a negative impact on public health or have a negative impact on on people that people people that staff live or care for. Um, so you don't want to increase transmission to your loved ones or those that you care for. And that should be factored into a risk assessment because um, you know, it's going to ultimately impact upon public health, health in the workplace, and it will impact upon your own stress levels and anxiety as well. And this all has to be managed by the employer and captured within risk assessments. And I, I just want to say that I appreciate that risk assessments can seem like a 
a useless um, tool sometimes, especially when employers don't implement them, but they are a legal requirement. And if we can get employers um, to capture all these risks and then they fail to follow the control measures we've agreed upon, then we're in a much stronger position when people refuse to go into the workplace or if a control measure fails, if they say, well, I'm at serious risk of it, serious imminent danger, I believe that to be the case. And they can then follow the procedures that we've negotiated under Regulation 8. So it all fits into a bigger picture, giving us a much stronger um, you know, bargaining hand. And also it protects our members individually and collectively. Absolutely. Yeah. So say all of us, uh, it's definitely not in the employer's interest for anyone showing symptoms to be coming into the workplace. So you would hope that um, some common sense would prevail there. OK, so the next question, not seeing any indications from a colleague. So uh, the next question um, comes from uh, somebody who teaches hairdressing and barbering and um, they are in the vulnerable category and they live with their mother who is in the extremely vulnerable vulnerable category and therefore doesn't feel safe. So the question is, should or can my employer redeploy me to a safer job? Alex, do you want to start? I mean... As part of the risk assessment guidance we put out, we did suggest that workplaces put controls in that looked at redeployment, alternative duties, and all those sort of things for, for staff. But I think in in this sort of instance, if the member felt they were at risk of serious imminent danger or, or you know transmitting it to their loved one, etc., if they didn't feel the controls were protecting them in the workplace from contracting COVID-19 then I think that's where they will find our, our letters that we've just produced, the template letters for branches. They will find them useful to at least protect their individual position um, in the first instance, while the branches are hopefully collectively trying to negotiate improved controls. Thank you, Alex. I can see Adam indicating. Go ahead. Old fashioned style, put your hand up there, like it. Yeah, just to add, add to this a little, a little bit. Um, we also approach it from a collective bargaining standpoint. Uh, these issues that have come up in the questions are very common in colleges. And, um, uh, you know, I've had lots of discussions with the employers in London about going beyond the government um, uh, categories of who is vulnerable and extremely cl clinically vulnerable. On the one hand, because there are a whole other uh, groups of staff who are vulnerable for different reasons. And so it's broadening out the category of who we think is reasonably um, vulnerable uh, on the basis of individual assessment and other, and other criteria, and then making sure the arrangements are in place for staff to uh, work safely in another way. And that implies on full pay, that implies people don't have to change their jobs or do something else. Um, and then I suppose the other side of that is people that are uh, in households with other um, family members or dependents who are vulnerable. And the same rule should apply. So it's not something um, the employers are keen to do. They're keen to, to, to narrow the definition of, of who uh, they will agree can work from home or not come in. But it's something we have to push back on. And it's something that ultimately has to be not only made safe, um, through a risk assessment about it, but it has to be negotiated by the union as an, uh, as part of the, the overall safeguards we're putting in uh, in place for staff. It has to be something that we, we actually push for and get um, uh, you know measures in place for. Thank you, Adam. That's great. Um, so there was a, a similar question that I, that we're not going to cover just because I think it's been covered already about um, forcing clinically vulnerable and extremely clinically vulnerable uh, people into into college when you know they could be working from home. So I'm pretty sure that that's been covered by what's already been said. Um, so the next question is a, a really interesting one uh, that I'd like to uh, say a few words on first. Um, which is where branches don't have many reps, which is obviously the case in a lot of FE colleges, how can the union help to organise and support members? Um, so the reason that I've got particular interest in teaching trade union education, we'll have to get not too, not too teachy here, but um, you know, the union, you know, is us, is you, is branches, is regions, is everyone. And you know, I do have a huge amount of sympathy for this as a previous branch chair of a, a branch where there were very, very few reps. Um, there's nothing more important than us having experience from the front line. That, that's the first thing that I would say. You know, expertise and understanding of a particular context uh, is so important. And we know that workplaces that have local workplace reps are safe 
for workplaces. You know, that, that's actually fact. Um, and they also have better terms and conditions and, and lots of other things. So um, one of the most important things, and it might feel like the thing that we never have time to do, um, but it is the most important thing is recruiting members and reps you know getting that support in the workplace because what we don't want is our branch officers burning out and uh, because that you know from a kind of hardline point of view you know used to anyone if you burn out but certainly you know from your own kind of mental health and your own physical health point of view and um, and it's really important that we're empowering members to get involved you know so many many members um, in UCU have expertise in this area health and safety and uh, you know and know the college back to front and we just need to make sure that it goes to the top of our list to have those conversations with people and bring them through and that I, it would be remiss of me not to advertise which I know that it's closed now the um, we've got an exciting number of branches signed up to the gym. In McAlevey organising school, which is the kind of thing that is to help us with this kind of recruitment. And of course, you know, from a kind of um, basic point of view, if you really don't have a workplace rep and you're worried, then obviously your regional office or your devolved nations office is, is your first port of call, or become a branch rep yourself. So, um, Joe, I, I, I was certain you'd want to come in on this one. Go ahead. Yeah, just on the, uh, I couldn't agree with more with everything you've just said. And the organising school um, is definitely a part of that, of actually saying, you know, the the more people we can get on the ground and the more ways in which we actually appeal to different people's, um, you know, interests and create solidarities. And I actually think that what we've all had to push back against with colleges' responses to COVID has, has been unifying, actually, for staff across a number of different um, levels. But on the on the on the strike school, on the organising school, the Jay McAlevey, uh, we had over three hundred and seventy members um, enrol. Uh, it starts soon. Um, a big disproportionate compared to HE FE presence. Um, prison members as well. We've got ten prison members, which I think um, is probably the most represented when you think about how many prison members we have altogether. But it. Um, it will be running again. This is not the only enrolment. So there's, it's running this sort of semester, if you like, before Christmas, but we will be doing it again. So check your inboxes for future events. Thanks, Joe. Um, and, you know, I know your, your competitive juices are, are flowing in terms of the, the National Education Union and uh, the number that they had signed up. Um, so I think we've got time for one last question. Um, you know, and if you don't have, if we've not managed to get to your question or if there's anything that we haven't covered, you know, please do go to that section in the UCU website. It's right there when you when you go in um, and they'll have a look at the new guidance and a lot of these questions might well be answered. So the final question is, what is the advice for members who are asked to deal deliver practical music lessons um, and obviously there's a kind of subtext to this which is lots of you know kind of close work um, teaching uh, but there are specific issues with music of course in terms of um, you know projecting your voice and that kind of thing so who wants to come in on this one Alex is that all right yeah I'm fine to come in the we don't have, obviously offer specific advice around um, practical music lessons in our national guidance, but you know we do, like you say, Janet, we do issue advice about work that involves um, less than two meters or work in poorly ventilated areas for the nature of the work that's um, taking place. So you know if you're at increased risk as a music teacher for various reasons, it might be aerosol transmission, poor ventilation, it could be you know there's too many numbers in the classroom, whatever it might be. You have to have suitable controls in place that reduce those risks to low levels. Now, ideally, we would um, avoid the risk altogether and find alternative means of delivery that didn't involve face to face. But as a minimum, you know, we would expect adequate truck controls to be in place to protect you from harm. And so there's a lot of guidance out there, um, even on the government website, about the risks um, of aerosol transmission. So I'd suggest that as a branch, um, and even as an individual, you highlight any issues that you think haven't been captured in the risk assessment to your employer. You've got a duty to highlight those hazards to the employer and the employer then has a duty to control them and reduce them to low levels. If that isn't happening, then again, you've got procedures in place. There'll be individual letters um, that you can that you can utilise and your branch can campaign and negotiate on those points. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in with anything else. 
Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and, you know, I want to say thank you to all of the speakers um, for, for their contributions and for the answers to those really tricky questions. Um, sorry, Alex, did you did you want to say something? It was just in case we're about to close, I did just want to touch upon the advice and guidance that we've sent out for um, Black members around risk assessments in the workplace. And I just want to highlight that because within that guidance, it does scrutinise what many employers are currently using which is a COVID age tool to assess risk within the workplace, individual risk. Now, of course, it's individualizing the problem. This is a collective problem. I appreciate that people will have different individual risk factors, but bringing people into the workplace when it's not safe is the employer's duty to control. But the guidance does talk about how the researchers who produce that model talk about not using it alone in isolation it's a guide and it doesn't capture all the hazards that people will face and individuals will face. So we know that our black members in institutions are going to face racism and, and that is a huge risk in terms of reporting hazards and controlling them as well. So if you take a look at that guidance, it does have a good um, critique of the COVID age model, which is predominantly being used in colleges, increasingly in higher education and throughout local government. So it's really important that as a branch, you understand how to critique that properly in order to protect um, members who are at increased risk. I'm really sorry, Maxine, I can see you indicating, but we are we are out of time. Um, so I'm just, just gonna have to say thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you very much to Seamus for um, interpreting um, in British Sign Language, I really appreciate that. And thank you to everyone for watching and for submitting your questions and comments. Make sure you use the website, make sure you contact your branch, make sure you contact your regional, regional or devolved nations office um, and you know have a good look at that guidance and, and thank you to everyone for, for your contributions. Cheers.